to start with a background. Uh, I think of America as having three segments of history. Everything up to 1860, everything. From 1860 to 1940, and then from 1940 to current. I break it up that way because everything prior to 1860 is I consider the British side of history, even though it's ultimately all British. Um, but from 1860 to uh, 1940 is where the, the everything changed. That's where the Constitution disappeared. That's where a new government was, was formed. And ultimately then in the 1940s, that new government was handed over to the IMF through the Bretton Woods Agreement, and then every United States citizen became a citizen of the United Nations. So if you guys are still United States citizens, you're actually uh, citizens of the United Nations, which is probably why there's so much activity coming out of the United Nations, and that's why they write so much of the, the rule book nowadays. So here we go. <clears throat> Can you see this okay? 1861, the uh, seven southern states had had it. They were done. They were done being pushed around by basically the international bankers. And they decided to leave the Union. That, that was, and they had every right to do that because they were sovereign individual nation states. They had the right to leave or break the contract because that's what the, that's what the Constitution was. They call it a compact, but ultimately it was just a contract. A contract between the states. So let me, I'll just read this. This is out of my notes. You guys, most of you don't have, but it says, when, so, when the southern states walked out of Congress on March 27, 1861, the quorum to conduct business under the Constitution was lost. The only votes that Congress could lawfully take under parliamentary law were those to set the time to reconvene, to take a vote to get a quorum, and to vote to adjourn and set a date, time, and place to reconvene in a later date or a later time. But instead, Congress abandoned the House and the Senate without setting a date, and that's called Sinadia. Uh, under the parliamentary law of Congress, um, it, Congress actually ceased to exist <coughs> as a deliberative body, a lawful deliberative body. And uh, in fact, they no longer even had the, the ability to declare war. So in 1861, on, on March 27th, Congress disappeared. The lawful Congress disappeared. So that's, that's what lays the groundwork for what we're about to just uh, cover over the next maybe hour or so, because I will try to get into the, the depth of the 14th Amendment. A little less than a month later, a man that was claiming to be president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, issued Executive Order 1. Why do I say a claiming to be president? Because he was no longer president. Because when Congress, when the United States, when the contract called the Constitution ceased to exist, so did the United States. The United States only existed because of that contract, because of the Constitution. So Abraham Lincoln issues Executive Order 1. And, and what he did was he established a military, martial rule, basically, over the federal territories. Martial rule. Not martial law, but mar martial rule. And here's what I, I try to explain. He, this was the first executive order ever issued. And, and sadly, think about an executive order. For those of you that work in the corporate world, if you have a secretary, it is as simple as this. The president or CEO of the company issues an order to go after a Subway sandwich, a cup of coffee. He, he asks his secretary to go refill his cup of coffee. That's an executive order, not, I'm going to create a military dictatorship. That's not an executive order, but that's what happened. They found a way to actually take back control of all territories, or at least the federal territories. And that's what Abraham Lincoln did on April 15th. Now, everybody knows what April 15th is today. Yeah. It's the day you guys all pay your taxes. Why? <laughs> oh, that's just a rhetorical question. So 1861, first executive order ever issued. 1862, 
the same unlawful Congress redefines the word, a word that we use every day, person. Redefine it from a word that we use in our regular daily vernacular to a legal term, meaning a fictional entity. So when you walk into a courtroom today, if they use uh, the word person, they're not talking about you, the flesh and blood man or the flesh and blood woman. They're talking about a fictional characterization that is attached to you. And that's how they got you into court to begin with. So they redefine the word person, the, a word that we use every day, into a fictional characterization. And remember this, that which you create, you control. So, I mean, it, 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 these, there's a lot of folks, a lot of patriots out there that talk about being a sovereign. See, the way I look at it is if, 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 if God exists, and I, I, I don't, I try to cross all boundaries here. If God exists, then he creates you, man or woman. Sorry, I, you know, I know my boundaries. <laughs> and that's, there's nothing between the two. That's sovereignty. And that which you create, you control. So, I mean, ultimately we're still, we're, we're still part of God's world. But see, in 1862, the state created the person. And that which they created, they control. And you'll see how this all attaches as we go. So in 1862, they created the person. 1863, Abraham Lincoln issues the Lieber Code, executive, or actually uh, General Orders 100. What is that? Well, go home, Google it, and then you'll, you'll start reading about your government. The General Orders 100, the Lieber Code, is the government we're living under. Remember, the Constitution disappeared in 1861. But in 1863, they needed some way to govern the territories, the federal territories. And they did that through General Orders 100. Go home, look up the Lieber Code, that's L-E-I-B-E-R, the Lieber Court, uh, or General Orders 100. Look it up, and you will see your government. You'll actually read it and go, wow, you know what, there's more things going on in here than I thought. It's a military government. Remember, this the, the dictatorship was established in 1861 because there was no co true Congress and there was no president. Also in 1863, the Supreme Court was abolished. Why would they need a Supreme Court when there was no Constitution? The, the Article Three judiciary didn't exist anymore, so why should they pretend they need the Supreme Court. They reestablished a new Supreme Court in the District of Columbia that they controlled completely. But it's not the same Supreme Court. I have all the documents, so when you guys are ready, or actually when you're capable of understanding, and I, 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 no disrespect, but this is a tough one. When you see the difference between this and that Supreme Court, they're splitting hairs. They're splitting hairs. But they, the one was abolished, and, 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 it, and it's actually right there in, in, in their words. Also, they established the, the USPS, the U.S. Postal Service. The U.S. Postal Service. What was that for? That was so they could keep track of the federal persons down the road. No pun intended. 1864. They redefined the word state. So, for how many how many of you folks in, in this room right now are? Uh, are, uh, are in Illinois. <laughs> yeah, see, most of you understand that if you raise your hand, I'm going to get after you. <laughs> because you've been around this too long. Why? Because, because the state is not Illinois. As of 1864, when they redefined state, they redefined it to mean, to mean, in their world, in their legal, in their law society, it means the District of Columbia. So when you hear the word state out there anywhere, even when a cop is talking about the state, he's not talking about Illinois. He's talking about the District of Columbia. In their legal world, the state means the District of Columbia. In 1865, the, I say the second 13th Amendment was created. Why? Because the first 13th Amendment was the amendment that was, that didn't allow uh, attorneys to hold office. 
you couldn't have a title of nobility with the original 13th Amendment. That was still part of the original organic constitution. What they replace it with in 1865, the one, the, the, the one that everybody talks about being so, so good. It was the freeing of the slaves. <laughs> that's what they say. No, that's not what happened. The, the, the 13th Amendment was not about freeing slaves. It was about creating a, 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 a government where voluntary servitude was a, was a possibility. 1868, which is what I'm going to really try to cover today, is the, the 14th Amendment. What happened with the 14th Amendment? Well, they now incorporate the word person, the new legal term person. What is the 14th Amendment? What's the very first line of the 14th Amendment? All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Who's they? The person. I mean, isn't it obvious? Where do all persons reside? Well, in the, in the state that they're created in. What state is that? Well, as of 1864, it was the District of Columbia. So all, when you claim citizenship, what are you claiming? Personhood status. And where does that person reside? The federal territory known as the District of Columbia. So if you think you're sitting here, when a cop busts through that door, they're going to beg the difference. They're going to say you're in the District of Columbia. Because you've claimed U.S. citizenship, therefore you're under the rule of the District of Columbia. So that's the very first sentence of the 14th Amendment. And I'm going to get into the rest of it in a little bit. In 1870, the 15th Amendment was passed. What, what amendment is that? That's the amendment for the legal right to vote. Legal right. Not lawful. Legal right to vote. What did they do? They made it so you had to register to vote to participate in, in their legal system. Did you need to register prior to that? No. You actually had a right to participate. Now you had to register. What does register mean? What does the root word mean? To registrate. To, you're actually giving over ownership of something. You're giving owner, over ownership of what? Your power of attorney. Your legal rights. The moment you register to vote, you're giving over the power, your power of attorney, your legal rights. By proxy now, they get a vote in your stead. And you have no say. It doesn't even matter what party is, is in power. Well, they're all the same party. But it doesn't matter because you've given it away out of ignorance, not out of you know foolishness or anything, but you really didn't, you didn't know. In fact, what did they say? Voting is a privilege. It is. It's not a right. It's a privilege in their world. And they, they, they've made it a privilege. And you know what? What can you do with a privilege that you can't do with a right? Take it away. Eight, also in 1870, something really important happened. The Department of Justice was created. Why? Because there was no Article III judiciary. They needed some semblance of law. But it says Department of Justice. Who, 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 under, what, under what does the Department of Justice fall? The executive. The executive branch. It's a department under the executive branch. So who's in control of the legal system? The president. The dictator. This is pretty sad stuff. That was in 1870. And ultimately, who's the top law enforcement officer in their system? The Attorney General? The Attorney General, right? In the Department of Justice? Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't have anything to do with the Supreme Court or anything like that? No, it's the, it's the Attorney General. I'm going to go off track here for a minute because I want, I want to read something so everybody understands who the Attorney General is. But and I'm going to close with this real quick, is that in 1871 then, a, a new private municipal corporation was created under the Organic Act. And this new private municipal corporation had a charter, a, a charter, a document of incorporation. And that was called the Constitution of the United States of America. It's a private corporate charter. And that their constitution, the one they created on February 21st, by the way, about three weeks ago, didn't they read a constitution into the record? Here's what they do. Every 20 years, like every other corporation, but every 20 years they have to read in the corporate charter to renew it. And they've been doing it every 20 years since 1871. And everybody's thinking that they're just being patriots. No, they're not. They're just taking care of business. 
So they renewed this private corporate charter, and all us idiots out there are out there rah rah because we're, we're, we're complete morons. We're actually participating in our own slavery. This was not the Constitution. This, this, this is not the Article 6 Constitution that says this Constitution, the one that was written in 1789. It was the Constitution that was assembled and put together in, in 1871. It was not this Constitution that they speak of in, in Article 6 of the Constitution, the original Constitution. It's a Constitution that resembles this Constitution. When they said this Constitution in Article 6, what are they saying? They're saying this moment in time, this Constitution. It's not a living document. It is very specific. The one they have now is living because they can change it up and do whatever they want. And very soon they will. With a con, uh, with a with a the con con, they're going they're probably gonna assemble. And then you're gonna see a new constitution altogether, which they've been working on since 1964. So that's the timeline. And I want to focus today on the, the whole concept of citizenship and why you don't have any rights at all. For those of you that have never seen this before, thank you. <laughs> this was the, one of the greatest shocks of my life, truly. A buddy of mine down in central Illinois, we were we were on the phone uh, just because, you know, when, when you know some of this ugly stuff, there's very few people to talk to. And we were talking about the attorney general, the fact that the attorney generals are actually the ones that run the Department of Justice, both in the individual state ups, like state of Illinois, state of Wisconsin, and all that, and also at the highest level, the, the attorney general that oversees all of the Department of Justice. This is, you can go home, and in fact, I would advise you to do this, go home and look up the Illinois uh, Attorney General, History. Lisa Madigan, go to the, her website today. History of. And, and, and go off to the side, there's the history of the office of Illinois Attorney General. Get this document, download it as fast as possible. If you can, try to take a picture of the entire website so people know that it actually existed before they take it down. This is at her website. In fact, it's written by Sean W. Denny, former senior counsel to the Attorney General. The reason I'm, I'm prefacing all this is because you got to know that this isn't just something at the website. It's, it, it's very specific. This, my friends, if this doesn't change your attitude about what you believe, Nothing will. In fact, if you don't care about what I'm about to say, I'm asking you to leave. That's how important this is. The powers generally understood to belong to the Attorney General at common law have been summarized as follows. It's about halfway through. The very first sentence. To prosecute all actions necessary for the protection and defense of the property and revenues of the Crown. Who's the Attorney General working for? The Crown Temple. The Crown. And now let me explain all you super hardcore patriots that are out there waving the flag saying, we the people. <clears throat> representation of the Crown is translated in our system to representation of the people. So the folks that are out there waving their flags that think they're the people, they're not, they're U.S. citizens, thus making them substratus humanoids called persons. It's just fictional characterizations. They are not the people. The people are those in D.C. protecting the property of the crown. That's the crown temple. It has, their job has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with your freedom. It has nothing to do with anything you ever thought of. It's outside of politics. It's all about property. And whose property are you as a person, a U.S. citizen? You're the Crown's property. This is one giant slave plantation. And we have never been told the truth. Go to the website, see if you're As you continue to read through here, it'll make you sick to your stomach. This is at her website. I'll read, it. I'll read the first paragraph first. The governmental and judicial systems within the United States of America at both federal and local levels is owned by the Crown, which is a private foreign power. Before, uh, I'd say, before, it says, before jumping in conclusions about the Queen of England and the royal families of Britain owning the USA, this is a different Crown and is fully exposed and explained below. It's, it's, it's the Knights Templar. It's the City of London Banking Institution. That's who it is. So go to the, the Attorney General website. You need to see this for yourself to believe it. I got goosebumps right now thinking about this. It says, 
uh, did you have an opportunity to read that yet? And, you know, I have it up on my page on the computer and looking at it going, no, because I was in, I had 50 irons in the fire. He called me back later that day. He says, you need to read that now. And he started reading those lines to me and it says, the, the attorney generals of every state, by the way, the, this season of treason I'm talking about from 18, 1861 to 1871, the initial office of attorney general in Illinois, established 1818 in Kaskaskia, was disassembled in, in, in 1867. They reformed it in, eight, in the 1870, new constitution for the state of Illinois. So a new attorney general office was created, which worked directly for the crown since 1870. We've been bamboozled, folks. Completely. Here is the 1789 Constitution. It was a contract. It created a byproduct of this was the legislature, the executive, and the judicial branch. That's Article, and this is Article 1 of the Constitution, Article 2 of the Constitution, and Article 3 of the Constitution. That is the United States. That's what the United States was when it was created. It also, what else does it say? To form a more perfect union. So the 13 colonies or the 13 states that were bound by this became a union of states. Why? So they could, so commerce could flow easier across the, the borders, the boundaries. I, I, I mean, in our case, even though we weren't there back then, it's, it's like the border between France and Germany. There's borders that have to be worked through. Well, Illinois and Indiana were no different than Germany and France. They were independent sovereign nation states. That's why they had a union of states tied together through this contract. This, think of this as a barbed wire fence. I say this every week because I want people to understand that there is, that there, these are two separate sides that I'm about to deal with. I just told you that in 1861, when the seven southern states adjourned, or actually walked out, seen a dia, Everything we knew disappeared. Everything we were told about the Constitution disappeared. So this is now gone. But remember, they also pretended this was this was still intact. There was no internet. There was no. I mean, a lot of a lot of folks were not able to read, and and, and only the, the educated truly had the ability to understand what was going on. And and most of the think about. It, I mean, think about. It. You know, 1861. Most of us don't really know what life was like back in then. I, I, I wish I was living back there now. But 1861, there was a lot of stuff out west where people were just lost out in the territories. They didn't know what was going on in the East Coast. So 1861, the Constitution, the contract known as the Constitution disappeared. Thus, the Union of States disappeared. So, But they pretended throughout the 1860s that this thing still existed. They had to. In fact, what did what happened in 1861? Lincoln is, he, he, he put out he issued Executive Order One to do what? Try to maintain the federal territories. Try to keep this thing together is what the excuse was. Uh, that that he got his marching orders from the international banks. So that's not the motive. The motive was the ultimate prize was the sovereignty of the states. That's what that's what the United States was after. The United States. The war was in the Civil War was not a war between the North and the South. It was between the North and the South and the District of Columbia. The District of Columbia won. It grabbed up the sovereignty of every state after that. That's what the 14th Amendment's all about. So here we go. In 1870, remember, you got this artificial legislature still moving forward as if it still existed. And it did what? It created the District of Columbia through the Organic Act. How many people know the name, the real name, of the District of Columbia? Uh, most of you didn't actually know it, but you're afraid now. You should be. It's the state of New Columbia. 
And within the state of New Columbia, there is a city called the City of Columbia. No different than Vatican City or the City of London. Vatican City is the spiritual aspect of this world triumvirate. The City of London is the financial aspect. And the City of New Columbia, the City of Columbia, is the war machine. That's what the District of Columbia is. It's the war arm for the Vatican. Over. So, man, did I get off topic. 1871, the Organic Act. Article 1, Clause, or uh, Section 8, Clause 17. What does it say? I wish I, I thought I had my constitution around here. But it says that the legislature shall have the complete authority over such district not exceeding 10 miles square. There you are. This is what the legislature has complete authority over. Complete. Well, remember, the Constitution's gone, the federal government's gone. It's gone. But they're pretending. Here's what our government, here's what we think is a government currently. We have, let's say, here's the legislature. What is the legislature actually? The legislature is actually, this is a private, for profit, municipal corporation. Yeah. Read aloud. Because it's really scary. <clears throat> now I see it. Uh, to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district, not exceeding 10 <coughs> miles square, as may, by session of particular states and the acceptance of Congress, become the seat of the government of the United States and to exercise like authority over all places <coughs> purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state in which the same shall be for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. So they have 100% authority over such district not exceeding 10 miles square. Complete. Now, think of this. Before I go any further, is this municipal corporation, is it on the same side of the fence as the government used to be. No, it's not. In fact, this is a private, this side over here, we're gonna call it government. This side over here, we're gonna call business. There's a giant difference, folks, giant difference. Over here is Walmart, McDonald's, the United States, This, the United States, is a private for profit corporation. It was established in 1871. This here, this 10 mile square, is a legislative democracy. That's, don't they say every time you hear anything out of their mouth, that they are spreading democracy <coughs> around the world? They are. Do you mind if I just ask you a question about that? Yep. Um, so Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, that was written at the beginning of the Constitution in 1789. Yeah, it was part of the original Constitution. Right. So, are you, so you would be saying that what had happened was in 17... I mean, in 1871, they basically, they're still using that somehow to incorporate this. I mean, I don't understand that the connection, because if it was pre, if it predates 1871, then it was already part of the Constitution, right? The original Constitution, right. which is this. So it was already part of the Constitution, so didn't they have that power already? Yeah, and they, but they did it before. Remember, like 1802, they established Washington, D.C., Right. So they had, an, they had an Organic Act of 1802, I believe, and they established the District of Columbia. But, and it was called an Organic Act. 
What does organic mean? Original. The original act. Can you have two original acts? No. See, when they had another organic act, they established a new private municipal corporation. So it was a different new. Yes, it is. It's another organic act. See, most people miss that. I mean, it's such a nuance. It's so slight that people go, no, no. You know, they, they established that. I mean, they've done that before. You can't have two organic acts. And, and it, they even called the one of 1802 organic. It, was, it established the first seat of the government. And that organic act applied to this constitution, this situation. It doesn't apply. This thing disappeared. They had to reestablish with uh, something to give semblance of the seat of the government. So they, they have a new organic act establishing a, a legislative democracy. And so that's the difference. Government's gone. They created this. It's outside the scope. And, and, this, and now it starts to make a lot of sense. So this, this group of legislatures, the, the, the Senate and the, the representatives, they're really what? A board of directors. And that's what they act like. This is a private municipal corporation, and they are running it as a business it is. It's a business. It's on this side of the line. And this is where it starts to make sense. I'll do that over here. Here's, this is, so let's just think of this as the first branch of their government. Here's the executive. Okay, let me clarify how, how come somebody like a, a Barrio Sotoro or whatever, Obama can hold office. Why? Everybody, all these people are out there screaming and hollering about a man that's born in Kenya, a, a British subject. How can he hold office? Well, he holds office because could he hold, could he be the president of Walmart? No, he ain't smart enough. <laughs> <laughs> you have to make a profit. You have to show a profit. My question. <laughs> could he, could, he could, he could be the president and CEO of Walmart, could he not? Theoretically. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter where he's from to hold off. How about McDonald's? Yeah. I mean, could he be the president of McDonald's? Does it matter what country he's born in? See, that's the thing. Is he is the executive. He's the president and CEO of a private municipal corporation. The Constitution has nothing to do with Mr. Satoro. You don't have to be constitutionally qualified to be president of McDonald's. You don't have to be constitutionally qualified to be president of this private municipal corporation either. So all you folks that are chasing this birth certificate garbage, you need to stop. It's no, a waste of your seat on them. That still puts seat on them and detract from their plan. No, because here, let me tell you why. Because everybody wasting their life chasing the birth certificate, they're actually helping the new world order. They're helping to herald it in. Why? Because that's what they want. They want people to be focusing on something because when they are ready to throw Obama under the bus, See, we need to actually remove their authority by noticing something way in advance. Just say, you know what? This is why he's in office, because he's not. There, there is no government. There is no country. We need to recognize that and then start moving in the right direction. That's why I'm saying they're going to use Satoro, when, and, and when he's done being used, they'll throw him under the bus, and if we don't recognize this situation, who cares? I don't care who's president of Walmart. I don't care who's president of McDonald's. I don't care who's president of the District of Columbia. It has nothing to do with law. It has nothing to do with the government. We need to stop. And this is the best part. I love this part. Not really. Here's the third branch of government. The Department of Justice, the DOJ. It looks like three branches of government, doesn't it? It comes underneath the executive branch, and there's and this, here it is. Here's one, two, and three. The difference is, the, this system of law, this legal system, comes out from underneath the dictator himself. 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 Yeah. Is DOJ, does that include the Supreme Court in this model? Yes, it does. But over there, it was separate and it had uh, a right to veto the president, but now it's just a pawn. Yes, because this judiciary truly was the Supreme Court and, and was the law of the land. Actually, that's not true either, because Article 6 states that the treaties are truly the law of the land, not the Constitution. The treaties are. Why? Because they need to leave the treaties in there so they can do what? They can have Promise. what happened in 1783, the promises back to the King of France. 
They need to have those treaties to rule this, because the Constitution, if you look up in your black law, what is it to be a constitutor made? To take on the debt of another. See, the Constitution was a crappy document from the beginning. It made all the minions, all the masses, the debtors for what happened in the Revolutionary War. That's what the, the people were doing. They were actually strapping. They, they went in, when they created America, the, the people, the elite, came in and they did all kinds of great things, but they were the ones that were, they, they stood to benefit. And, how, and they didn't want the debt from the war. What did they do? They wrote a constitution. Actually, they didn't write it. They only, witnessed, they only witnessed it. There is no signers, by the way, of the constitution. Let's be clear about that. Only witnesses. That's kind of an odd thought, isn't it? How come nobody signed it? Huh. Anyway, different day. So my point is, I don't know. When you wrote about the constitution, then you said they were witnesses. Right. Who, who, who set the constitution up then? I don't know. We don't know that. We don't know. No. No, I don't know that anybody knows. Really? Yeah. Because there were no signers. There were only witnesses. The, the, the act, I mean, the Constitution, everything, by the way, everything is hearsay at this point. Right. I thought in history it was Jefferson and somebody else. That'd be a nice story. Thing. Is that what all that is? Just a story? I think so. I, 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 so it came from some dark abyss and saddled us ever since. City of London. Yeah, they probably wrote it. I, I, and again, I don't know. I, I know just enough to be dangerous. But I'm not going to go there today because I'm trying to stay on track for Bruce. <laughs> yeah. Does everybody get this? The Attorney General, I, I spoke of this earlier. So imagine the, the top dog, the Attorney General, is acting as the, the, the top Attorney General for all the Attorney Generals. And who does he interface with? The Crown. See, so nothing is as it seems. One more quick thing. What was this thing about the 10? Square mile. What was the significance of ten square miles? They had. It sounded like they were confined to all their shenanigans in that ten square God, miles. God, I love you. Here's why. <laughs> because you're about to see how it happens. How how can they possibly get us if we're not there? Just remember, I said earlier, the Fourteenth Amendment says all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States. <coughs> and of the state wherein they reside. Persons. Okay, here we go. Does everybody have this? Because now I'm going to go into the 14th Amendment and how it all fits together. I'm going to answer your question right now. I'm going to try to draw Illinois like it, not like I did last week. <laughs> I'm going to draw Illinois over here on this side where it would be a union state, the 21st union state. Here's Illinois as the 20, uh, here's the union of states. Illinois didn't exist at the time because it, it didn't exist until 1818. And that's in Kaskaskia, that's where they, that's where, that was the seat of the government in Illinois at the time. So this, okay. I don't know. Cool, not bad. So here's, here's us. <laughs> this is Illinois, the 21st union state. And here's how it affects you. Well, first, let me let me do this. The legislature has complete authority to write all policy, everything for such district not exceeding ten miles square. Policy, any here it is, public policy. Just like in Rome. Just like in Rome, public policy is public policy law. No. No. Where did, what does it affect? Where, where, did, where, where is it in force? It's administrative. It's administrative. And, where, who, and what does it affect? Corporation. <laughs> but the public policy that this legislature, this, this, this board of directors writes, only applies to here, the District of Columbia. That's it. It cannot reach beyond the 10 mile square. And that's what's so interesting about this. Is the Patriot Act law is it constitutional? No. no. Does it have to be constitutional? No. no. So here it is. The Patriot Act is here. A public policy written by this board of directors. It only applies to the 10 mile square. How about the health care bill? Is it law? No. Yeah. No. no. It's probably under their system it is. No. No. It's, it's policy and it's only statutory. It's not law. So who does it affect? It, oh, here's here's health care bill. Who does it affect? It only affects the citizens of the District of Columbia. 
How about the, 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 the food bill, S510? Is that law? Nope. No. Who does it affect? It's policy. It only affects the 10 mile square. S510. <laughs> how in the world does this 10 mile square and all the public policy that's written for that, how does it get to us? It doesn't. We get to it. So here you are, <coughs> sitting in a chair in Rockford, Illinois, and then you, what do you do? By either silence or participation, you become a United States citizen. And you place yourself as a resident within the federal territory known as the District of Columbia. So you are all persons, claim personhood status. The person now is subject to the jurisdiction of this corporate state called the District of Columbia. So now you know that when, you're, you, when you think you're sitting in Illinois, you have already made contracts to participate in their private system. Oh. Because you're claiming U.S. citizenship. That's what I'm going to go into now. You, the United States citizen, you used to be a protected 10th Amendment protected citizen of Illinois. But then you claimed U.S. citizenship. In fact, are you a registered voter? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> because when you register to vote, I'll do, I'll do that real quick. Because all of it is part of the 14th Amendment. Does everybody understand how you attach yourself to this private municipal corporation? By the way, in, in, in the Organic Act, it actually says, in their words, that this private municipal corporation shall have all the power of the Constitution. Or it says all the power not inconsistent with the Constitution and laws of the United States. What does not inconsistent mean? It means consistent with. So they have this private corporate charter. I'm holding it in my hands. This is the private corporate charter for the, for the 1871 business that was created. What, is, what does it look like it says there? The Constitution of the United States. This is their private corporate charter. It looks very similar to the Constitution that used to be over here. But it, th that Constitution disappeared. I'm getting it. I really am. I can tell. But when you said there, is the ambiguous they. Who the hell are they? Those corporate officers. That's but how do they perpetuate these interests? There's got to be an overriding entity that... Who do they work for? I really The don't Crown. Know. Well, that's, again, the bank over there. No, it's not. That, and that's what people need to understand is that you don't understand. When, you, when we say the word bank, we always picture Alpine Bank down the street or some little local. No, this is something so insidious. So, so I'm thinking now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, that'd be right. But these guys are, in, that's how they take over entire economies. By putting somebody in debt, enslaving an entire population, and then pull the rug out from under them. They're doing it right now. They're doing a heck of a good job. The bank, the, the city of London, is doing it. It's it's the Rothschilds. It's it's the Khazars. It's all these folks that have been tied into this crap. It's 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 the Jesuits. It's the Vatican ultimately. That's who's doing it. But we don't see it that way because we don't want to believe what we're. I mean, we're witness to it and we don't want to believe it. So that's. But you see how this lays out so easily. Take off your government goggles. Put on your business goggles. Everything that's happening is for money. It's for profit. It's gonna, this will get really crazy. So here we go. You're sitting here thinking you're here. You're, you're thinking that the Tenth Amendment is going to protect you. But you claim citizenship to a private, for profit, municipal corporation. Person. What is a person but a fictional corporation? Are the, are, are the, is the Rockford Police, are they a corporation? Yeah. Doesn't it say all persons born or naturalized? The, the Rockford police are a person subject to the jurisdiction of this private entity. There is not a business or corporation out there that is not subject to this. You realize that if, 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 if the, the company you work for doesn't collect your taxes, guess who's going who's to get in trouble? You? No. The company you work for because they're a person subject to this jurisdiction. And they, they're going to close down that company if they don't steal the money from your, your, your paycheck before you get it. That's what a person is. A person is a fictional entity. It is also a U.S. citizen. Does everybody understand how you put yourself in here? The only way to get out of this is, is to cut the tie. You've got to not be a U.S. citizen. The thing is, is 
this stuff is so important. Do you realize if, if, if only 10% of America knew this, would they be participating? No. 10% oh, of 300 million? Oh my gosh. You know, that's, that's a pretty good number. So here's, here's what happens. And this is how it works. Here's the Founding Fathers' Republican form of government. Okay? That's where the unalienable rights are given by God. That's where this is where freedom is. Okay? This is one system. This is the system that the founding fathers created. Here is is another system. This is called the United States. You see they're separate by the way for a reason. Here's what happens. In this system, which is private, by the way, it's private. They call it public. Don't mix it up. Because they call it public because you need to look up the word public. But understand it's private. In their system are the Democrats, the Republicans, the Ron Pauls, All what appears to be politics. All politics. What appear to be politics. All politics. This is the legislative democracy. Now here's what's sickening. What system were we supposed to be living under? This one. Remember in 1860, 1870, 1870, what happened in 1870? The 15th Amendment, the right to vote. This is voters registration. What's the first box at the top of that sheet that you check? Are you a citizen? Of the United States. What does the Declaration of Independence say? It says that governments are instituted by the consent of the government. So we're the government. We're sitting out here, living under here. But in 1870, after this reconstruction of the United States of America, what happens? They, they now say that you need to register to vote. No, you don't. But you think you do. You have to register to vote for what system? Their system. Did you need to register prior to this? No. Is this a privilege or is it a right? It's a privilege. They keep telling you that and you keep believing it. And it is. Is it a privilege you want? <laughs> Not really. So here, here goes. The Declaration says governments are instituted by the consent. So this is consent. And we institute this. We do. And we allow it. We want it. We like what we got right now, don't we? That's this system, folks. Consent. Now here's what's funny. When you when, when we talk about this two-party system, it's really not a two-party system, it's not a three, it's not a tea party, it's nothing. It's all of that stuff is in this private system. There is no two teams. It's not the Bears and the Packers. It's the same team. Sometimes playing offense, sometimes it's a scrimmage. <coughs> They're playing each other off, off each other to get as far ahead as they possibly get. And we're sitting out in the stands in the Coliseum cheering for them. Huh. I would say that they're much smarter than we are. So what did, he, what, did, what did I say earlier? Power of attorney. When we register, we read just straight, we hand over the rights, we hand over title, legal title, <coughs> to our power of attorney. So now they're going to speak for us by proxy. We don't have any rights. We actually gave it to them. And it doesn't even matter who wins. And then what do they do? They run up and down the field and 
And they steal money from us. They steal property from us. And, and guess what else they do? They get rich because they sold their souls. And who loses? All of us that trust them. So by proxy, we lose everything. And it's by our consent that it's happening. What do we need to do? We need to not only unregister, but we need to withdraw our consent. What does the declaration say? Governments are instituted by our consent. The moment you undo this, whether they recognize it or not, everything I've ever read says it's all about consent, biblically and everything else. The moment you get out of this system, you fall over here. Is there anything over here? No. Is there any governments over here? No. Why? Because everybody thinks this is what they should be doing. So there is no government. So you're sitting out here by yourself, and, and that's where I'm at. That's where my wife's at. That's where half a dozen of us in here are at. We're by ourselves because we refuse to participate in this system. Because I know for a fact that when you register to vote, that is the last vote you ever cast in your life. It's the vote for the system. Because after that, everything is irrelevant. Now, here's what's an in, here's some interesting 14th Amendment fact. I, I, I'm actually talking about the 14th Amendment. I just didn't say it. How many people in here know that every registered voter can buy? Remember, you're part of this District of Columbia, the legislative democracy. What? How many electoral college votes does the District of Columbia have? Three. Three. How many registered voters are there? A lot. 150 million? 100 million? Do you realize that all 100 million registered voters combined have three electoral college votes? How can you expect to pick a president when you have three electoral college votes? It doesn't even matter what side you're picking. You got three total. Everybody combined has three. I would say that that's not fair. But it is fair because it's all by consent. This is the system we choose. Here's it. it gets worse. But even even if they only have three electoral votes, the just the mere fact that they're even if they have no electoral votes, just the mere fact that they're voting in that system is consent. Is the consent. We so we perpetuate it. The three electoral votes is kind of a peripheral kind of icing on the cake, but... <laughs> I like to say it. But yeah, but <laughs> just the mere fact that you're consenting to that, you're still voting for a Democrat or a Republican, we're all on the same team. That's right. right. And, and sadly, we think we're participating. You know, the, the, now they can look into your eyes and say you actually are participating. I mean, it's called, it's a lie by omission. They don't tell you the whole truth. They tell you that they're representing you, yeah, with three electoral college votes. So then where are the other 435? Does it matter? It's not yours. That's my point. They, the Senate actually gets to move around the rest of this stuff. Remember that it's just a board of directors. And see, you get three electoral college votes and they vote the rest of them. What's the likelihood that they don't pick the winner every time? That's, that's a, that, that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> Here's another one. If what I'm saying is true, and it is, does the District of Columbia, it, it actually states, I believe, that does the District of Columbia residents have, wait a minute, it says the states have congressional voting representation. The states. Now, if you are a resident of the District of Columbia, do you fall within that definition? Do you reside in the states if you're a resident of the District of Columbia? No. No. You reside here. Only the states have congressional voting representation. Should you expect to be represented in Congress? No. How could you? If you're a resident of the District of Columbia. It blows my mind that people don't talk about this stuff because they're afraid that you can't, there's nothing that we can do. Bull, you realize that we always control, we always control everything by our consent. We, it, 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 and it gets worse because I'm going to, I'm going to try to stay on track here. Does everybody get this? See, we have to cut the ties to this garbage. We're, we're actually the ones that are causing all this. So let me just go, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really get into the 14th Amendment issues. 
<laughs> so here's, I, th this, I got this a couple years ago when I still believed I was a patriot. I'm not anymore because I'm not going to fight for my own demise. This is from Don Manzullo. And this is their corporate charter. And I used to, when I first got this, I used to sit out in the yard and I had all these different colors and, and, and things that you see here. Those are different days, months, weeks of me investigating this crap. And now I realize this should be in my bathroom. <laughs> Just in case I run out of real toilet paper or Federal Reserve notes. In that order. But anyway, this, this bright orange thing here is the 14th Amendment. I'm going to tear this up and then we're going to be done and, and then I'll, I'll field any questions. Section one, there's four sections. There's five actually. There's actually only four. But the fifth section says, the Congress shall, this is, this is one of my favorites, and very rarely, I get, I'm saying it now up front because I'm afraid I'll forget it. It's section five says, the Congress shall have power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. Why does it say that? Loophole. It's a loophole because this is not the Constitution. It's a corporate charter called a Constitution. And they need to legislate their authority because it's not an amendment to the Constitution. They need to say, we can do this because we say we can do it. They can create any rule they want. It's a living document at this whatsoever point. Whatsoever with that little caveat. That's right. So here we go. Section 1. I've already started, but I'm going to cover a couple of legal terms here because they don't use words. When you listen to President Obama speak, he's not speaking English. He's speaking legalese. The things coming out of his mouth are not words. You need a law dictionary to understand what it is he's saying. Is that like Swahili? In this case, yes. <laughs> By the way, I've said this before. Uh, the whole, what is it, uh, I can't even remember right now what movement, the, the, you know, where you can't talk about other stereotypes and politically correct, politically correct movement, sorry, that gets left at the door. We can say anything we want here because I'm not going to talk about things that aren't true or true. It really is. No political correctness in this room. That's, that's the rule. <laughs> Here we go. Section one. All persons born or naturalized in the United States. We know what persons are. They're fictional characters. Born or naturalized in the United States. It does not say United States of America. It says United States. And subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Subject to. Let me read from their Bible what subject to means. Okay, remember, all you 14th Amendment citizens out there, all you, 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 you flag-waving patriots, subject to liable, subordinate, subservient, inferior, obedient to, governed or affected by, provided that answerable for, all persons are subservient to the United States. Does that sound like freedom? Sounds like slavery. 13th Amendment states that slavery, but it says voluntary servitude is a possibility. So by design, are we deceived into servitude? You better believe it. How many people would want to be U.S. citizens knowing that? None! Uh, and the thing about the 14th Amendment, it was supposed to, it was supposed to, enshrined the citizenship of slaves, in particular black African slaves, but it doesn't say that. It says all persons. Blacks were, 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 were considered property prior, and the person's status, the personhood status, it's a status, it's a political status. The status of person has always existed. It goes all the way back to Rome, for some of you that said that earlier today. The status of person goes all the way back to Rome. The person has been around forever. This is not something new. But they did introduce it in 1868. So, how many people want to be a United States citizen when they find out that you're subordinate? Sub Why is it that they, they treat us so poorly? Because they can. Because we are subservient. If we claim personhood status, 
If you're a man or a woman, you're not a person. But here's what's interesting about that. It's not, there's not just one person. A person is actually a persona. You can be a father, that's a persona. That's a person. But they're all usually commercial entities. If you, and, and, and there's some good stuff out there. I, I, I recommend Robert Menard up in Canada. There's a lot of good guys out there. But he explains persons very well. If you join a health club and you have that card, that's a, that's a persona. That's one person. Is it the legal person they're speaking about? No, it's not. So are you, is that a contract? Yes, it is. But is it a contract with the government when you have a contract with the health club? No, it isn't. But it is a person. So when we talk about getting rid of the person, we're talking about getting rid of the legal entity called person under the 14th Amendment, not, not your health club uh, membership. That is a person. It's a, cor it's a corporate fiction that you have to, that's the only way to interface with another corporation. You have to establish the personhood status. So when I say person, I mean legal fiction for this entity, the 14th Amendment. So all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction. What is jurisdiction? Jurisdiction is authority. The authority of what? The United States. So all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to, subservient to, obedient to, the jurisdiction of the United States are citizens of the United States. What does that mean? Why is it that there's, and this is one of those patriot myths that I, I can't stand. The 14th Amendment citizen in their writings is a small c citizen, whereas an Article 4 citizen of a union state is a capital C citizen. Why is there a difference? There is. Look, at, look in, your, 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 in your constitution to see the difference yourself. The privileges and immunities have a capital P, a capital I for the Article 4 citizen of the Union State out here. They have real state 10th Amendment protections. Here's a question for you guys. I, obviously I'm drawing a dividing line so you already know the answer. If you claim citizenship to this, and this is where the Constitution lives, should you ever even expect constitutional protections over here? How could you? You've given them up. The moment you register for this private system, you've given up the Constitution. So when you walk into their private courtrooms under the Department of Justice, where this is, should you expect the Constitution to be there to protect you? No. Is it ever there to protect you? No. See, it all starts to make sense. But, and, and so let me just keep going. So all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state the District of Columbia, wherein they, who the persons, reside. Where are the persons created? In the District of Columbia. All persons are born there. I'll explain that in a second. That's really what, how it all, this all got started. I mean, the fact that you're here today is because I wanted out completely. And I got tased last year, uh, last January in Roscoe, Illinois, for allegedly not using a turn signal. And that was the day I quit. I said, I'm done. Can I just, before we go off on that, can I just ask you a yeah. question? Here? So, all this stuff over here on the right, which I hate to think that it's on the right, but <laughs> all this stuff on the right, you should change it around. Yeah. It's all now on the left. On the left. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't see that. Um, all this stuff on the right is all. Because you have to replace our free form of government with a new form of government. So that replacement of government, although it resembles the Constitution, it's now primarily statutory and administrative type rules and laws that they've created under, under a, the, like a commercial code type, type, type situation, right? Right. And then, um, so having it under this over here on the right, um, you, you can't you can't really flip around in, a, in like a judicial situation and say I'm a I'm a free citizen, but I'm consenting to your all your administrative stuff over here. In the original Article Three judiciary, let me just read it. 
there were four types of law. You had the common law, which was for the folks that lived on the soil of the Union States. You had equity, which was contracts between the people. You had admiralty slash maritime. What is that? Maritime contracts are international contracts by nature, and admiralty is a maritime contract during emergency or wartime. So those are, those are the only possibilities. And that was in the constitutional world. Over here, there's only one. They merged them all together, and it became the, the Uniform Commercial Code. It became all commercial, and it's all contract. There is no common law. There is nothing that resembles it. When you, it's like being at an auction. When you don't even know you're involved. You raise your hand and wave at a buddy, and you're, now you're standing before a magistrate because you realize you just purchased something called 30 days in jail. It wasn't <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't the lawnmower you thought it was. The point is, is that it's all it's all commercial contract, and, and there is no law. Law disappeared completely, 100% in 1938 with uh, Erie, Pennsylvania versus Tompkins. It was gone. All law disappeared completely. They they had some semblance of law up until that point, but after Erie Erie Tompkins, it, it disappeared. Everything is now a uniform commercial code, completely written by the Vatican. So it's a ruse of law. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what it is because. On the Madigan's website, they preach about the common law. Yeah, that's what she's all about. Well, uh, I, I'm not in, in, in a course that I'll be doing on trust in, in a couple months. When you realize that the common law was actually established in 1307, right. and it's not what people think it is either. That's not God's law. No, and, it's, it's precedent. And it's and it's and it's uh, and that that as well was established by the Vatican. So I'll go into that some other day, but that's not that's certainly not for the Fourteenth Amendment. <laughs> Sorry. By the way, who here has, gets receives their mail with a zip code? Remember, in 1864, the United States Post Office was created. The zip codes are federal territories. If if, if something comes in your what you look what looks like your name through a zip code, that's the person. That's the 14th Amendment citizen. That's the presumption. And it looks like your name. It could be in all caps. It may not be, but most of the time it usually is. In fact, everything out of this place, including the IRS and things like that, all comes in all caps. Look it up in your dictionary. It's called Capitus Diminutio Maxima. It's a lowering of status to the person. And it, But it's a, it's a resident. When you claim zip code status, you're claiming federal territorial residence. When you claim that it's like the man down on the ground on the soil reaching up into the fictional world and once you grab that mail out of your box you've attached yourself to the person called the 14th amendment citizen and now you're responsible for everything that that, that brings with it so that don't think that just by thinking you're, you're not participating there are so many attachments at this point this is one diabolical group of people and i do mean people actually so Let's move on. That's section one. I'm not going to cover section two, but it does relate, and it's a little too difficult to, to, for a first day. Let's go to section four. Section four, just... I think that second sentence is very appropriate also. Okay, want me to cover it? Yeah. This is... Yeah, thank you, because no this state. is... Yeah, it says... But remember, it's whatever they want it to mean. This is their legalese. It says, in the second sentence, thanks Bruce, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges, small p, and immunities, small i, of citizens, small c, of the United States. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor deny to any person within his jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Think about this. You used to be here. That looks a little better. You used to be here. And the Tenth Amendment would protect you. But when you claimed U.S. citizenship, this state can no longer 
protect you because you claimed to be a resident of this state. So it says, no state shall deprive those over there. When you claim U.S. citizenship, you put yourself in here. And now, because of that claim, the, pr the protections laid down by the 10th Amendment cannot protect you because you chose to be living under those rules. So it says no state, see they change it around now, no state shall abridge the privileges and immunities. If you go into your Black's Law again, there's two separate forms of privileges and immunities. There's the 14th Amendment privileges and immunities, which are small p, small i, and then there's the Article 4 citizenship of the Union State privileges, capital, capital P, capital I, immunities. Those are protections by the, for, by, the, by the 10th Amendment. You see, when you claim to want to be a beneficiary of this 14th Amendment system, this private system, where they, they give you Social Security benefits, and they, and they give you all these other goodies. When you start claiming those goodies, you're here, and you lose the rights, the unalienable rights given to you by God over here. You're done. You, would, you traded, and I mean this, you traded your freedom for goodies. And no state shall protect you because they don't have the authority anymore to stop what's going on over here. You've claimed it. You want that. That's what you get. And I'll be darned if, if, this, if, if the state, the union state, can help you. Is that where Ms. Christian of treason comes from? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover that, but that's... But is that what's going on? Have you just committed a, a, a treason for doing that? Ms. Christian of treason by leaving the Illinois state and voting yourself in? Yeah, voting registration. Yeah, thanks, thanks Eric. I'm going to... So, does everybody understand why the second sentence, now all of a sudden, when they speak of a state, they're talking about the union state. And they, the union state can no longer protect you. So, now we'll go to section four. Is that... Is that good? Figuratively, that is the fence that they have erected and abolishes the sovereign state. They made it so the sovereign state was impotent. Because you've chosen your path. You... Just like the Declaration says, governments are instituted by the consent of the government. You've now consented to this system, and this system can't protect you. So what by you your choice. You talk about nullification and all that. What is that? It's irrelevant. Okay. Because there are no people in the in the Union States anymore. They all change, they all claimed personhood status over here, so there are no people and there are no governments in the Union States. That's why the state of, the state of Illinois, I'll explain that before we close up here. But the state of Illinois and the Union State of Illinois have nothing in common. Uh, no, real state. Yeah, they can't help you. Here's a man of flesh and blood on this soil. Here is a fictional person that, that, that claimed personhood through the 14th Amendment. They don't actually interface anymore. The fictional guys live and die by the rules over here. And you have claimed attachments to this. That's why the police, when they come and pick you up, they, they, they put a body attachment on you. And so here's the fiction over here living under these rules, and then they come over here and extricate the man from the soil and throw him in their warehouse called a jail. We, there is no way to save these people. It's their choice. They need to back out of this. They need to, 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 to cut the ties. They need to decide. We can't do it for them. Because there, aren't any, there is no there is union state. There's, it, 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 it exists only in geography. There is no government for Illinois, the union state. There is no, uh, there are no people populating it anymore, even. I mean, it's a hard concept. There's a million Hispanics that are not U.S. citizens <laughs> in Illinois. Hey, you know what? I, 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 yeah, I, I'm good with that. As long as, as long as they're willing to create what's required or, or fall under the, the real leadership. But they're not citizens of the state. Union state no more either. Well, no, you're supposed to be. A, you, you ultimately, the law of nations states that you are a citizen of the nation of your your father's birth. That's the way it works. It's worked that way forever, and that's the way it always will work. So, if you're a citizen of Mexico, you're going to be a citizen of Mexico. Now, can you can you do something different and become like they used to do? Can you can you fit into this? Yes, but you know, but there it'd be easy now because there's no government. I mean, I, I would welcome a whole lot of Mexicans in Illinois just to take back this. I, I mean, seriously, if they had the same spirit and the same understanding of what's going on here, welcome aboard, welcome home. Yeah, because freedom is freedom. How do we get our freedom back? Are we going there? We, we have, yeah, we have, we, it, it's so simple, it, may, it boggles the mind. 
Let's have it. Okay, well, let me just finish this because you need to hear this. There's only one, this is it. Okay. It's only three more hours. Yeah. <laughs> okay, does everybody get this concept? It is, it, it, is only, it ultimately is this simple. Remember the original 13th Amendment said no, no titles of nobility. And what do they have? Nothing but esquires, nothing but lawyers or attorneys involved. So here we go. This is the last, this is really the focus. Section 3. Wait a minute. It says the, the validity of public debt shall not be questioned. You need to know this. Why? Section 4 says that the validity of the public debt shall not be questioned. In every society, every form of law, ecclesiastical, common, it doesn't matter, legal society, in every form, as a debtor, you are disabled legally. You have no rights until the, the creditor is paid off. So when you claim U.S. citizenship, you automatically become a debtor to the public debt. You, you are attaching yourself to that. So that being said, do you have rights? No. So, and, and, and it goes along with all this stuff. Not only do you give it up here, but you're also attaching yourself to the public debt, and now you have no legal rights to speak either. They've got you coming and going. And you want it, and you think that that's a benefit to be a U.S. citizen. I say it's an anchor. Kurt, has there always been debt? Yeah, because the Constitution was written to make everybody constitutors. This year, though, remember the Constitution disappeared back in 1861, so they had to find a new way to do it, and they did. So, yeah, there was 10 years there where it looks like you might have been free, but you were for 10 years until they redesigned everything and gave it back to the Crown. So, so that, does everybody understand the public debt? As, as a debtor, you ha you're legally disabled. When you walk into a courtroom, you have no rights because you are a debtor, and that's been the case throughout history. So they attach the debt to you when you claim citizenship. So now you're claiming this crap, all the all the goodies over here, but you're also claiming the public debt, which means you've given up your rights legally as well. So you're legally disabled. Section three. This is there's two parts of this, and then I'm done. I'll take questions. But section three says no person. We already know what that is. Shall be a senator or representative in Congress, or elector of president and vice president. No person. We already know what that is. It goes into some gobbledygook, which will make sense in a little bit, but it says, but Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each house, remove such disability. But it says no person. What do we know of the person already? We know that the person is a debtor because he's a U.S. citizen. So what is one disability they have to remove? Yes. Citizenship. Yes. Those in Washington, D.C. are not United States citizens. Because if they were, they'd be a debtor and, and, and be legally disabled. They could not hold office. But by but Congress removes what? They remove citizenship. So those in D.C. are not citizens. When they are no longer persons, which are citizens, what do they become? The people. So they are the people in D.C. And they don't have legal disabilities anymore because Congress removes it once they accept office. So the people are in D.C. without a debtor status. There's one other side to this. And, and uh, Eric was bringing it up earlier. When you claim, when you when you register to vote, you're actually committing a crime. What is it called? It's called misprision. That's M-I-S-P-R-I-S-I-O-N. Misprision. What is misprision? Well, let's just look. Everybody open your black laws. <laughs> misprision. See, People don't realize that all this stuff, misprision, it's kind of a weird thing. It says a word used to describe an offense which does not possess a specific name. It goes on to say, but more particularly and properly, the term denotes either one, a contempt against the sovereign, the government, or the courts of justice, including not only contempt support, properly so-called, but also all forms of seditious or disloyal conduct. Conduct. When you register to vote, you commit an act called misprision. You are actually sh showing contempt to the Constitution. Your disloyalty to the Constitution. You're actually forming a new form of government over here. A legislative democracy. You're giving thumbs up to a private institution. You're walking away from this, and it's, it's actually a criminal offense. And they treat you like a criminal. Because you are one. 
That's why there are no criminals in D.C. They're the, they're the people in D.C. Because they've, they've, by a vote of two-thirds of both houses, they've had the disability of misprision removed from them. So not only are they not debtors, but they've gotten rid of the misprision aspect as well. And you know what we are? We're, we're, we're a bunch of criminals that are, get treated as such. So can you imagine finding out that after all these years and after promoting all their system, you find out that they've been that you've been a, a, a criminal just by the act of registering the vote for a private system, and then they take themselves out of that system so they can rule over you. That's what's happened. And now I'm going to close with this so you understand the concept of states because it's really important. Oh yeah. So here's the way the states work. I know I'm going to use Arizona because somebody brought up the Mexicans. Damn those Mexicans. It's not their fault. They were being invited for a reason. Well, you're totally here illegal. So here's I'm going to use Arizona for a reason. I want. Everybody knows the problem, and I don't mean it in a bad way, but the problem of Mexicans streaming over the borders of Arizona. I brought a map with me today so we can look at that. Here is Arizona. Arizona has ge geographic boundaries, does it not? It actually has a landmass. The Union State called Arizona has a land mass with borders. One of those borders is on Mexico. That's the Union State called Arizona. There is another. This is this is a representation of the state of Arizona. It is a corporate charter. Jan Brewer is the CEO running this private corporation, this private franchise connected to this private United States. This is the state of Arizona. It has nothing to do with the landmass called Arizona. The boundaries of the state of Arizona are probably an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And the state of Arizona is in probably a file cabinet somewhere in the District of Columbia. It is not a physical location. It is a corporation. It is a political subdivision of the United States. Jan Brewer has nothing to do with this landmass whatsoever. <laughs> nothing. In fact, legally, she has no authority to do anything with this landmass. There is no government for this landmass. There are no people in this land on this landmass because they've all chosen a new path. This private company. There are no Mexicans flowing across the borders of this. They're flowing across the borders of a union state that has no representatives to stop it. We need to understand that what's happening here, there are no borders anymore because what we have is this fictional federal territorial run dictatorship established in 1861 and there's no way to stop it because everybody wants to participate in this system. Illinois, the state of Illinois, is no different than Arizona, the state of Arizona. We can't stop anything either. We don't. Have, this this situation here occurs in Illinois, the state of Illinois as well. There is no borders to the state of Illinois, folks. This is so upside down and backwards that there's no possible way to stop anything until we get our heads out of our asses. There is no way to stop what's going on. But you know what? There's one simple answer for the states to unincorporate and go back to the union state status. Why? Because when you unincorporate, you get rid of the personhood status. This corporate charter is a person under the 14th Amendment subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. When they unincorporate, fall back into union state status, what happens? You see what happens. All of a sudden, there's a government potential again, but there's no government potential right now because everybody wants all the treats. They forget about the tricks. But they want the treats. They can do that though, unincorporate. Only if there's some, some folks that understand this stuff or comprehend it. You see how simple that is? No, here's the way it works. Let's get there. 
there is no way to go back. Even, and I don't normally say this, but even this union state was ultimately owned by the crown. So there, even, even the union states were controlled. I don't go there, but it, there is no way back. We need to start fresh. We actually need to disregard everything, break all contracts, walk away from their system, their financial currency system. We need to cut all ties, all contracts, walk away from this thing. Do not restore some pathetic republic that, that never was good for us. We were always slaves to that state. We need to stop. We need to stop thinking we were ever free because we never have been free. We need to start over, walk away from their value-based system or lack, lack thereof. We need to not think that our currency has any value. We have to quit breathing life into the beast because that's what we do. Our job every day is to, to prop this crap up. All we have to do is stop breathing life into that beast and, and cut all ties. But will we do that? No, we won't because nobody's going to walk away from that brand new big screen TV they just bought. They're, they're holding on to every asset they have, everything, because their entire value system, their, their entire sense of self-worth is based on their brand new car, the, the addition on their house, the kids in a private school. The, their entire system, is how fat their wallet is, that's who they are. You take away this currency system, by the way, the currency system called the Federal Reserve Note is a private note, a private note that was created for this system. It is not constitutional money. The Federal Reserve note is not constitutional. It was created because the Union states could not use real money anymore. They had to use the currency. There is no way back. We have to be honest for once in our life. Look, when you get up in the morning, you look your, into your eyes in the mirror, and you realize, what are you willing to do? It's all or nothing. You either are willing to walk away, like the Declaration says. What, did, what was the last line of the Declaration? <laughs> Give our... Secret, uh, our, our secret honor, our, our, our lives, our, lives, our, 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 lives our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Those cats were ready to do whatever was required. We, no, 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 no. If I can't make my house payment or my car payment, you know what? We're going to have to be willing to not make any payments. I'm not saying because we can't. I'm saying because we won't. Though every corporate contract that came out of here has been a fraud. A hundred percent has been a fraud. Every banking institution is now running this entire, it looks like a corrupt government. It's not corrupt at all. It's business as usual. It is not corrupt. It's working perfectly. And when they decide to flip the switch to cancel everything, it's over. They take everything. And why? They take everything because we actually will say, we're gonna honor their contracts. In a dishonorable system, we're gonna honor their contracts. I say, why are we honoring their contracts at all when it's a dishonorable system? We need to walk away from all of us. Who's going to do that? How do you withdraw? You mean physically? Yeah. Right, here's what happens. And this is, your question was, how do you withdraw? Everybody withdraws their consent from a, diff a different way. But ultimately, you can go as far as you want with it. The withdrawal of consent is, it's biblical. Everything I read over the last two years basically shows one nexus one cross and that cross is consent everywhere you look the concept of consent in all their treaties and all their documents the word consent consent is the number one issue in all contracts without a meeting of the minds there's no contract in at any level so when i say withdraw consent i'm saying you have to do something you can't stay silent silence is consent so you have to be proactive and turn something in to let somebody know that you are not this. So the first thing you do is you you learn the words. I have a document that I wrote. I wrote it after four days, after being in jail for whatever I was in jail for, after being tased, after my wife got put in jail for swinging her purse, after what the, the other thug from Roscoe was, was, was attacking her, while these guys laughed. And they said, good, now we have her for, uh, uh, what was it? Aggravated assault. Why did they do that? So they could confiscate our car. So they could impound our car. So they could take all our property. <laughs> everything is about stealing everything from you. That is their job. Charges. Charges. So the point is, is that how do you withdraw consent? Number one, it has to come from here. It's not from here. If, if, if you think it's going to be analytical, it's not. You have to feel your own sense of value. You have to realize that their value system is not worth your life. 
And that's why this is such a struggle for people. They don't realize that it's about value. It is not about the law. It's about whether or not your life is worth it, whether you're willing to walk away from all the stuff that they say is valuable. I don't think there's anything in the system of value. In fact, I mean, there are people right now that are helping build FEMA camps for the overtime so they can buy the big screen TV for camps that they'll eventually wind up in themselves. themselves. How stupid are we? So to, I, I don't know how to answer your question because I wrote a document. I will, I will send it to you. I can't give you one right now because I only have one that I carry with me, and it's my protection from the thieves, the thugs, the, the, the biggest gang in the world known as the, the, the police department. I carry it with me. I'll show it to you, but I'll send it to you. What I do is this. Who is the number one law enforcement officer in Illinois? The Attorney General. I send this document to the Attorney General. I let them know what I'm not and who I am. I send one to the governor. I send one to the Secretary of State. Why? Because your driver's license, your li driver's license is commercial. Who is it? Why is it commercial? Because it deals with the commercial entity. What is that commercial entity? The person. So everything that they've done to you is for you. I mean, is that your driver's license? No, it's not. It's the person's. Do you have a social security number? No, you don't. You never have. The person has it. But you claim it as yours. See, everything they've done to us is to get us to believe that it's something it's not. And when we attach ourselves to their system, we claim it. We need to just walk away from their entire system. So those are the three at the top of the state. Are, are you born in Illinois? And then what is there? If I can disclaim myself from this thing, then what do I have? Do I have... Look, you have peace. Of I'll be, I'll be, how many people have withdrawn their consent in this room? What does it feel like the moment you drop that stuff in the box? Beautiful. Great. We have personal responsibility. That's what we have. Wait a minute. Let me, let me, and let me answer this. The 16th Amendment, the tax that you're, you're talking about, the, 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 the taxes, income taxes only apply to U.S. citizens. It does not apply. It only applies to corporate persons that were created as U.S. citizens. It does not apply to the man, the woman, or the, the people. When you look into the tax codes, nowhere in the tax codes... Yeah, is, I understand. But is, so, on a practical level, they're going to pull what I got. I won't be able to function in this matrix. You can, yes, because you, you because Hill versus Hankel says that you can contract with anybody you want, but you have to establish your manhood, no offense, you have to establish your manhood first before you can, you're undoing all the garbage, you're, you're negating all the stuff you've done all your life, and then you come back through and you can contract with anybody you want. Can you still have a license, a commercial license to drive? Absolutely. Would you drive with it when you're not driving commercially? Absolutely not. Would you show a cop that when you're out there just traveling from point A to B? No, because it's not required. If you drive for a living, yes, you, you would show it to them while you're driving for a living. But see, there's so many nuances. I can't, ex I can't answer your question in, in five minutes, but I could answer it over time, and only you can decide how far you want to go into this or, or out of the matrix. This is the ugliest situation I've ever seen, and the, the problem is, what am I losing? See, that was your ultimate question. Your question was, what am I giving up? I say, you're, getting, you're gaining peace of mind because you're no longer swimming in blood from, the, from what the United States actually is. It's a murder machine on a worldwide level. It, all it does is go through and rape and pillage and kill people for profit. And you know what? That was, the, that was the reason I initially got out. I got out because I couldn't ultimately deal with the fact that I was promoting it by being a U.S. citizen. The first thing I did was think, I'm no longer going to swim in the blood of the planet. After that, I figured other things out. But I am not going to participate in this garbage. And that's what it is. I'm withdrawing my consent politically because that's what it is. U.S. citizenship is a political status first. You're, you're cutting the tie of the person. You're no longer part of the statutes. When a cop pulls you over, is he dealing with a man or a person? He's dealing with a person. Because why? The statutes only apply, the, the statutes that written as policy here only apply to the person. They do not apply to the man. So when a cop pulls you over, is he talking to you or presuming your personhood? He's presuming your personhood because that's where his authority comes from. My point is, you can take it as far as you want. The only then, so locally, what you do is you send in the same document, um, but you need to learn it. <laughs> I mean, it, there's a lot to it. But you need, but you need a black law fifth edition or older. You need to look at these words and understand what the legal terms actually mean. And when you understand it, and I walk, I walk anybody through it. But when you understand it. Then you feel different. You go, wow, you know what, that, this really makes perfect sense. And you feel cleansed because you're no longer participating in the ugliest thing I've ever imagined in my life. This is the war machine that was established by the Vatican to murder everything on the planet. All the chemtrails in the world are coming from this beast. The fluoride and water is being spread by this beast. 
everything imaginable on a, on a planet Earth that's bad is from this United States, not from America. Right. Dave, this has been established exactly for what's happening right now. And you know what? We are the ones that prop it up, like I say. We breathe life into this. We, the Declaration states very clearly that governments, doesn't matter what style, governments are instituted by the consent of the government. We are consenting by our participation or our silence. We need to withdraw that consent to stop. Do you realize that, and I'll, I'll close with this, every cop that pulls you over to beat your ass, to tase you, to murder you, whatever, every cop that does that has your, your consent. You authorize it the moment you signed up for your, your driver's license. And what's worse is there are brothers, our uncles, our fathers, our sisters, our, our, our family members. The cops that are doing this to us are us. The doctors prescribing the drugs that are shooting the children up or putting in the, you know, the tracking devices, call it what you want, they're your, your grandfather, your grandmother, your uncle. Change to my, April, and it's been going on ever since. And they're us. The, right. the New World Order that. cannot progress without our help. We are killing ourselves, and we're and why? For the big screen TV, for I the fat wallet TV. Believe that, me, it ain't for the TV. Yes, it is. And it is it, 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 it's it's for the stuff. Please they know the difference between a person and a man, because I have the, the, the vehicle code in my home, and there's nowhere in there. When you when you say I am not a person or I'm a man, it stops them in their tracks because they know the difference. We just put a new Congress in there. Did they take them into a closet over there and show them the ropes? This is what it is. First, I can answer that's a two-part question. Number one, we didn't do anything. You don't have any authority to elect anybody because you have no congressional voting representation. Remember that. You didn't ever pick anybody. They did. And to answer the second part of that, yes, they do. They have an option from the moment they get voted on, and a friend of mine, Joyce Rosenwald in California, has been doing this stuff for 35 years, and she's been nothing but, she's, she's been a, a, a researcher for 35 years. She says, Kurt, I don't have any evidence of this, but I do know this happens. When, between, the, the moment they get elected, the two months, the space in between, they are told how they're going to do things. And if they don't, and, 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 and here's, the, here's the deal. They, they, they're instant millionaires to the capper, the, 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 the capper, the profitability of this. So they're set for life. They're, they're set for life. And the other side of it is they're threatened. So their choice is, do I follow through on this and become set for life financially and I don't get killed or my family members don't get killed? That's, the, that's that one side. The other is I don't, I don't take the office. That's their choice. So when they walk into this, they are absolutely 100% they're, look at every single Tea Party that, that that got brought into the system recently. They they, they they folded immediately. Why? Because now they're playing ball. They're millionaires. Do you really think that this system isn't going to win unless we just yank ourselves out of it? We're propping it up. It is that simple. Consent. Everybody says, "Girl, what are we going to do?" I'm sorry. Nothing. We're going to aggressively do nothing by withdrawing our consent. They, they know what we're doing. I'm sorry, but man, we need to go and arrest everybody in D.C. and put them on trial, have, have, jury, have our own juries, grand juries, put them on everybody trial. Everybody that's even thought of that, if they're U.S. citizens, they're going to be thrown in jail or murdered. What? Are you going to murder us if we got a million people to do it? We won't ever have one. My point is, is that it's not, nobody gets this stuff. It is not those in D.C. that are doing it. We are. No, we're, they can't, there's 445 or 35 people. They're not doing it. We are. We're the ones putting ourselves in jail. The judges are putting us in jail, but they're our family members. We are the ones doing it. We can't, we don't, I don't even give a, sh give a shit what's going on in D.C. Not even a little bit. We are the ones doing it to ourselves. The moment we wake up to that fact is the moment this shit stops. I am sorry, but I can't ever agree that they're doing it to us. We are. We can't do anything to stop this until we recognize who the, the absolute beast is and it's the beast within us. We need to stop it from within. But the Vatican... And the, and the folks in London, they're, they're, hey, those, the, there are systems that they've set up to, to be able to... And you know what they're doing? They're using our human nature against us. And the moment people quit valuing the, the dollar, it's the moment it stops. This is a value-based problem, folks. It, it's not anything to do with...
these people. It has to do with us. If we didn't consider the wallet more important than our neighbor, that's what the problem is. We're more concerned with the big, the big screen TV than we were with the safety of our neighbor. That is the problem. It is spiritual, 100% spiritual. This has nothing to do with law. It happens to do with the heart and the fact that we, we are treating our neighbors as we feel about ourselves. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Guess what? 90% of the people I meet hate their existence. And you know what? Their neighbors are absolutely being treated accordingly. I can't stand the thought of most of the people that are more concerned with the freaking public school system than they are with the welfare, and I mean truly the welfare, of their own family. Their sisters, their brothers, their neighbors. They're more concerned with what's in it for me. We're going to lose, and we've already lost. We've lost because we don't recognize that these are not the enemy. We are. The moment we're done, we're done. The moment we're done looking at them because they're the scapegoat for us. We can keep talking about them, but we're the, we're the problem. That's what I can't stand. This is not the issue. This is the obvious what's wrong, but you know what? Every judge in Rockford lives in Rockford. They are related to somebody. I, you know, we should never speak to another attorney because every attorney in America works for the crown. So if you have a brother, a son, a father that's an attorney, I would never speak to him again because they know this shit. They're the enemy. They're the ones that are putting people in jail for profit. So until we recognize who the problem is, it is not these people. Amen. It is us. Yep. Well, people need to be in jail. You got an argument with me. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I, and my point is, we allow this stuff. Yes. It's all consensual. And you know what? Everybody in those, there is no, there is no courtroom in America. They're all banks. There is no courtroom. They're all banks. So when people realize there is no law. I can get all those concepts. But, but what? There's got to be something else. There's not a No, there is nothing else. It's there's all, one game. No, it's yeah. us. It, when we're tired enough, when we're beaten down enough, when you're marching in the street, when we finally see it, that, that the guy pointing the freaking rifle at your head is, is your neighbor. It's over. And now you realize that it is us. But it is us. We're marching against ourselves. You, who, who, who actually is... Who's protecting these people? The police. Oh yeah. The fire departments. The, the attorneys. The, media. the judges. The media. Everyone. There are people that go to their job at WROK that are passing erroneous fake artificial oh, yeah. information every day. You know what? For what? A paycheck! You just said, a you said the key word. Truth. That's all it is. When, we, when something's happening right in front of us and we deny it. And that's it. I mean, if we can't work together for once on this planet, if we, if we, and we're not, we're not going to work together. I already no. know this. Every, no. I mean, the Christians are angry at the, the Muslims. The blacks are angry at the whites. You got the, the rich are, are trying to protect stuff from the poor. The, supposedly, and again, I've only read this recently, but the, the, the uh, Rothschilds. Suppose they have a net worth in the $23, $24 trillion range. Now, what did I just say? The Rothschilds have a net worth worldwide, globally, of somewhere between $23 and $24 trillion. That's only if we value the dollar. The moment we walk away from their system of value, they can't even put food on their table. Because we're the ones that are giving it value. We need to say, you know what, we're going to create our own, I don't know what that system is, but I know it's not the one we currently have. No. If we walk away from their private currency system, they can't even feed themselves because they don't bring, anything, right. they don't bring anything to the table. Nobody. In fact, if we created our own, that giant Mundelein family will stop. We control that, but we won't give up our currency system because that's who we are. We identify with our stuff. It's because we don't have an alternate. We don't have an all You know what? System. You can never wait till the ducks are all lined up. You oh. gotta just jump. I know well, it's scary, but I'm I'm wait jumping. for them to put the water in the pool for a <laughs> I agree with that. But the sad thing is, does this make sense? But that's the thing. Is it really is. They're not the problem. They look like the problem. I know.